are excited? Today, the session is actually something about the expectation. And we have a great, great expectation from a prominent speaker. So to call the session in order, or probably, you know, the clapping, we do it before. Uh, you know, we have a luxury of having Davis, sir. I guess after you won the award, this is the first time you, you've been coming to any event for us. So if you can have, you know, clap for him, please. He has won the Business Leader Award, and it's a, and a big, proud moment for all of us. So it's a big, proud moment. So may I invite uh, our chairperson to come forward, please, and officially inaugurate the session. Thank you, C.A. Shanaz Khan. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all for today's CPE session. Uh, the topic is very interesting. The speaker is a very versatile speaker, so I'm sure everybody is looking forward to it. Uh, you would have received one email today about the badminton session. So we are having a badminton session happening on 23rd of this month. Uh, so please do register for that if you are interested. And uh, we would have one more CPE session. We, we would try to have one more CPE session in the month of November before we break for the uh, National Day holidays or something. So next week, hopefully, uh, we should be having one more CPE session. And uh, as soon as we uh, get the CPE approvals and everything, you should be receiving the email for that. Uh, we have uh, uh, our chapter first foreign trip which we have planned and we changed the location from Beirut to uh, Bhutan and Nepal. So we have uh, some members have uh, shown their interest to join in. If anybody else would want to join in, please let us know. We would be doing the ticket bookings tomorrow and uh, so that would be our first foreign trip of the chapter. Hopefully this should continue also as an annual uh, event for the chapter. Um, without much further ado, I think uh, we are all uh, looking forward to a wonderful session from C.A. James Ravi. I request uh, C.A. Shanawas Khan to take forward the proceedings of the day. So friends, uh, we are all uh, united by profession, but divided by what? Any guesses? Any guesses? Attempts. So we are all united by profession, but divided by attempts. Before the, the customary to introduce the speaker of the day, Though he's well known, may I invite my colleague Ravi uh, to come forward, please, and formally introduce the speaker. Hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, Mr. James is no, no, no uh, new face to the ICA. So let's start with his uh, all. The, I just find, find, find out that I want to summarize, but I cannot summarize this. But I will try to summarize. So he's a FCA, a CPA. He was a first regional director in uh, of the GCC region. He has uh, uh, done extensive uh, research on the IFRS. He has a good, is a well known trainer par excellence. He's uh, he's uh, he's he is currently working as a director of audit and assurance with Crow Oman, and. Uh, I just respect him. Thank you very much, sir. And please join us for the chef. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, may I guess we have a privilege of having Devi sir here. Uh, may I invite Devi sir, please come on stage. So we need to honor the speaker of the day with a flower bouquet. Thank you very much, sir, for doing the honor. May I invite uh, C. Ravi James to come forward, please, and start the session. Good evening. It's always a pleasure to be with the August uh, audience like what we have today. I always consider that as a great uh, blessing that I could share the knowledge of um, I gained over the years with uh, <clears throat> honorable members. And it has been my practice uh, when I was living in UAE and uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Russell came chapters. Whenever there was a need, whenever I was called to talk on something, I always uh, went very delightfully because I enjoyed doing that. And uh, this evening, we are going to talk about expected credit loss. And it's not something very new to us. We all went through the one-time grilling of doing the ECL computation last year. And the regulated entities and uh, SAOG companies, they have also gone through three quarters this year, recomputing the expected credit loss. Um, we have done, personally speaking, I have done more than uh, around 200 entities uh, expected credit loss. 
And uh, most of them are, almost all of them are in non-banking sector. And uh, when I was asked to talk on some subject, I told that this would have been an interesting topic since uh, in uh, Muscat chapter we never spoke about it. And uh, as such, the title is a bit of a misnomer uh, because IFRS 9 doesn't say anything for banking and non-banking industries. There's only one model given, that is expected credit loss. And uh, however, for practical purpose, uh, when we apply it, it needs to be done in uh, two different ways, as the standard provides two different approaches, general approach and simplified approach. And uh, the standard remain silent and not specifying which approach to be used for which sector. As we all know that, the intention and the foundational concept of IFRS is always uh, making one set of standard applicable across all the sectors. Unlike uh, US GAAP, which has sector-wise accounting standards, IFRS has one standard applicable all over the world and across all industries. The same thing they followed with ECL as well. Now, having seen our clients around uh, 400, 450 of them and reviewed their way they have done ECL, uh, there's a very wide, varied practice prevailing in the market and um, when we were reviewing and auditing the, some of the ECL models developed by the other audit firms, including the big four audit firms, none of them was <laughs> uniform. Everyone did what is best understood by them. And uh, even today, I would say that there is no uniformity in the methodology to be adopted. Their main reason is IFRS kept everything completely wide open. And this is what they do. When we read the standard, they write around 3,500 pages of standards. But when we have a specific doubt, when we go and read it, things are left just either complete omission or very vague way of putting standards so that nobody can really make anything out of it. It takes a lot of reading and understanding and practical application to come to a consensus of what is to be done. The same thing applies to ECL as well. For the basic problems are there is no one set of ECL computation model. The standard doesn't give any methodology, nor a financial model, nor any technique. It's just left with the vague definitions. And uh, above all, people don't read the standard. People would like to read something about the standard. Some interpretation, somebody has given a notice, some uh, media release, some journal article. Only these things people like to read, and uh, nobody reads the bare standard as it is. I understand the uh, predicament in the minds of the reader when they read it, because I always used to say that uh, if anyone is suffering from insomnia, the best cure is start reading the standards. For within a minute, you will fall asleep. The English is archaic, the sentences are complicated, and it is purely written in the context of English-speaking English. Uh, especially people like non-native English speakers like us and other parts of the world, it's always a Herculean task to read and understand what exactly the standard is telling. The same thing goes well for ECL as well. For so these are the four points I would like to put forth as a framework before I go into the standard. For so there is varied practice, there is no uniformity, and uh, everybody does what is best understood by them. Nobody has read the standard and done it. And 
Today's title is also a little bit of a misnomer as there is no separate standard for banking and non-banking as such. Uh, today my endeavor will be sticking to the standard. I'm going to take out the paragraphs, though there are around some 170 paragraphs of entire IFRS 9, the ECL is covered only in 20 paragraphs. So I'm going to stick to those 20 paragraphs and I'm going to put it on the screen so that when you go back, you will know what I'm talking and from where I am talking. Because most of the articles, most of the uh, materials, what's available, they say something, but they never refer the paragraph number of the standard. As a result, you don't know from where this guy is telling this. So I don't want to put you in that uh, jeopardy. For I took the uh, difficult task of putting the paragraphs of the standards on the screen and going through them with you. Oh, that's my endeavor. There is an element of risk there, I know, because as I said, reading the standard is one of the most difficult and boring topics. And if I am sitting there, I would rather sit close to that door so that when things get boring, I can rush away. <laughs> I think none of us will not allow us to go. For nobody will dare to go early, I think. Okay, for, with that introduction, let's see. For before we go further, I'd like to take you through the journey of IFRS 9 and where we are, I mean, from where we started and where we are now. As you see, the whole thing started with the 2007-2008 subprime crisis started in uh, US, and that was a trigger point. We need not go deep into that, as you all know what happened. For entities like uh, Lehman Brothers started with that, and it triggered a global economic meltdown, and it went all across. That economic recession still is prevailing. I don't think that we can boldly say that we are out of it. We are still deep into it. That's what we all understand. For in that background, when they analyzed the reason for the economic crisis, the easiest scapegoat was the accounting standard. You know, we all know that the real reason for the economic meltdown and the crisis was complete free for all regulatory uh, system. That means the regulators who are supposed to regulate the economy and the banking system left it completely loose. It didn't happen in 2008. It started from the time of uh, the past president of US, Ronald Reagan. For he was the one who opened the floodgate in 70s. And uh, even in uh, US universities, you can read about Reaganomics, that is Reagan's economics, where he opened the regulatory system completely and he was very much helped by the US uh, uh, SEC chairman, uh, sorry, Fed chairman at this time, Alan Greenspan. How many of you remember his name? For Alan Greenspan was there from Reagan's time and he was sitting almost until the junior Bush time, until the Ben Bernanke took over as a Fed chairman. For he, along with Reagan, started the process of complete opening up of the economy, not in the positive way, but in many ways, the regulatory restrictions, the overview, the supervisory uh, norms have been completely let loose. It's free for all for the banking sector. For they went giving loans and uh, complete risky assets were accumulated by these entities and that they again securitized that and then redistributed those risky, very bad subprime, that is not the prime first rating, but downgraded assets all over the world. That is why when that collapsed, all the banking sector got collapsed. For that was the main reason. But nobody was ready to accept that. Even today in the US, it's complete free for all. And to rectify it, they went for something known as quantitative easing. You all would have heard about it. Where they started giving $700 billion, take it, do something to revive the economy. That was the thing. 
And uh, Fed was happily printing the currency as they were not having any gold reserve, as they depend on other economies like uh, Europe and China and India. Therefore, they did that, and that further weakened the situation. But the easy target to blame was the accounting standards. For the banking sector, the regulators, everybody started blaming the earlier accounting standard, which was IAS 39, telling that this was the standard was the main problem because of the standard, especially the practice of MTM, mark to market. That is, at the end of the year, you need to revalue your assets and take it to P&L according to the market value. For that was the unrealized gains and mainly unrealized losses. That was the reason for the economic collapse. That was the scapegoat. You know, it's almost like if you don't like the message, shoot the messenger. That's what they did. For main problems they found with IAS 39 was, number one, it was following an incurred loss model, which historically that was the right thing to do because accounting, we know very well, is a postmortem job. It's not something future projection. We are supposed to record what happened and we are supposed to report what exactly happened. The whole thing, the whole truth, but nothing but the truth. That was a job of accounting. But that was found to be a weakness as we were following incurred loss model. And number two was what provisions were made was too little and too late. So these are the phrases used. And the third one was front loading of the interest. That means even without analyzing the the risk status of the assets, the interest income has been front-loaded and the asset itself was becoming bad. As a result, the income statement was overstated. Now, whether there is truth in that or not, these were the accusations made against IAS 39. For immediately, the G20 nations leaders went heavily on the, the standard setters, both the FASB of US and the IASB international standard, telling them that you need to do something and come out with a new set of standard for financial instruments. That was the background. And as soon as it happened in the year 2008, IASB and FASB jointly published a discussion paper. As you know very well, the standard goes through three stages, discussion paper, exposure draft, and the standard. For so they published it. And they really did a good and fast job. So in the year 2008, they published the discussion paper. And in the year 2009, they came out with the easiest one, which is the classification of financial assets. Then in the next year, I think I can take it out. OK. So in the year 2009, I think I yeah, use that one. Yeah, I think so. Sorry for that. And 2010, they came out with the financial liabilities classification. And 2014, they came out with the other two parts of the standard, which is basically the hedge accounting and the impairment model. But as soon as they came out with the expected credit loss model, until then, the FASB, the American standard setters were with IASB. They happily, jointly made the standard. But once the standard was made in the US, I mean both IASB and US gap together, it was approved by the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission of US. That means all the listed entities and the regulated entities will have to follow the standard. But when it went to the Wall Street bankers, they created a big hue and cry, and they went and did a big lobbying in the Senate and told that we don't want this standard. As a result, US GAAP standard setters will have to roll back the standards, and they told the IASB, sorry, in US, we can't make this standard, especially on the impairment model, as the expected loss model is not acceptable. Our industries are not ready to accept it. For you, go ahead with your own standard. For that was the first time since 2004 until 2014, all the standards which were made jointly by IASB and FASB as a single set of standard, they went diverged. 
before ECL was the first stage. Then IASB went ahead with that standard and went a lot of, it was originally, you know very well, it was supposed to be effective over 2015, then it was postponed to 2017, then they postponed to 2018 with a lot of changes. And effective 1-1-2018, one, one, IFRS 9 came into full effect. For we have uh, all the four aspects, classification of financial assets, classification measurement and class classification measurement of financial liabilities, and expected credit loss, and the hedge accounting. In hedge accounting, what happened? IAS 39 was having a hedge accounting model, which was used by most of the non-banking sector again which is based on one-to-one -one hedge accounting rather than a portfolio type hedge accounting. But IFRS 9 came out with portfolio dynamic hedge accounting where it could be macro hedging can be done instead of one-to-one -one hedge accounting. For currently, though IFRS 9 has come into effect, IAS 39 is still there. Only the old hedge accounting model is still there. It will continue to be there. Please don't think IAS 39 is dead and gone. It is not. I would say it's still in coma. It's still alive. It's kicking, especially for the hedge accounting aspect of it. For IAS 39, it's separately there. And coming to insurance sector, as I see some insurance faces here, uh, IFRS 9 was given an exemption until... IAFRS 17 is implemented by insurance companies. As a result, insurance company is, companies are the last one to board the train as far as IFRS 9 is concerned. And they will be, or they are expected to come complete with the IFRS 9 implementation, effective 1 1 So that's a gentle outline I'm giving about IFRS 9. So that's how it happened. Then what happened with the FASB? The last line, if you see, FASB, that is American Financial Accounting Standards Board of US GAAP, they came out with a modified version of ECL. The name itself is a big uh, oxymoron. <laughs> they say that it is not ECL, it is CECL, standing for Current Expected Credit Loss. Is it current? are expected, how it could be current and expected. We would ask the US guys to explain what it is. And that is going to come into effect on 15th December 2019. That means all the financial statements which are going to be published as of 31st December 2019 will be in compliance with CECL, all the US companies. You are following US GAAP. That's the scenario now, yeah? So with that, let's go into that. So here, once again, I'm telling you, I'm not going to give you any uh, out of the book model. I'm going to stick to the book, the red book of IAS uh, and IFRS, and uh, what the standard says, we will go through it. So how does IAS or IFRS 9 define the standard, the uh, models, especially the ECL model? IFRS 9, very important point, please note, does not provide any financial model or formula or methodology. Please note that point. If anybody is coming and telling this is a model and this is IFRS model, don't believe. Because the model doesn't, the standard doesn't give any model. Yeah, point number one. But what it says, it says it simply provides two approaches. They are the general approach which is covered in paragraph 9, 5512, 5514. For over 14 paragraphs are covering general approach. And the simplified approach, which is covered by another two standards, uh, two paragraphs, IFRS 5515 uh, 5, 5, and 16, two paragraphs. And generally, the understanding in the market is, since we all implemented once, the general approach is implemented by banking sector and the simplified approach is implemented by non-banking sector. Yeah, and if you want to go deep into, I'll just tell the periphery of general approach. I won't go deep into that because it'll take at least three hours to talk about it. But I'll just tell what's happening with the general approach. But today our focus is going to be simplified approach as 
we gave the title as ECL for non-banking sector. Please, once again, keep in mind, the standard doesn't say that it is to be applied for banking, it is to be applied for non-banking. In practice, people have made, made it up like that. The standard gives only two approaches. This is the exact term it gives, general approach and simplified approach. And then, as I told, there are totally 20 paragraphs. For 14 paragraphs for general approach, two paragraphs for simplified approach, and next four paragraphs are for how to measure the ECL. Again, they don't provide any model or formula or methodology. For general approach is based on, so let's see first general approach. General approach is based on the criteria. If the credit risk increased significantly or not from the beginning of the year. That's the criteria. For if you are at 31st December 2019, you are going to see what was my credit risk for a particular asset as of 1-1-2019, or the original date of the asset, if the asset came into existence during the year, and compared to that, what is the level of my risk as of 31st December 2019. If the credit risk increased significantly, then we have to apply lifetime loss. If the credit risk has not increased significantly, then we have to apply 12 months loss. Or put it the other way around, all good assets, performing assets, for them also you need to calculate 12 months credit loss. And under the old model, we started making provision only when it becomes doubtful. But under the new model, even the good assets, we need to provide 12 months credit loss. Yeah? That's the point. For if they, now the question of defining what is increase, you know, like credit risk has increased significantly. As usual, the word significant is up, appearing in all the standards, and nowhere it is defined what do you mean by significant. Whether it is 20%, 25%, 30%, 40%, the standard is silent on that. Okay? For, for example, how do you define an associate company? An associate entity is an investment in which the investor has significant influence. What do you mean by that? Silent. I won't tell. But they went ahead with the 10 paragraphs of explaining how the significant influence could be there. Like there could be a separate... It could be, generally, under the old system, what we have, if anything more than 20% shareholding, it's supposed to be a significant influence. Or if you have one representation in the board, it's supposed to be a significant influence. Because the definition of significant influence is power to participate in the operating and financing decisions. For power to participate in the sense, you have at least one board representation. Yeah? For that's how significant is defined. For otherwise, there is nowhere it is defined. For how do you define credit risk as increased significantly? That was the first point. Logical question. For as usual, they try to keep as silent as possible. Try to explain in 10 paragraphs so that you will read and get bored and close the book rather than understand what it is. But at the end, after so much of compulsion from the people who are writing back to the standard setters at the exposure draft stage, they came out with a definition. Yeah? So, that definition is, how to determine significant increase in the credit risk is, there is a rebuttable presumption that if the particular due has passed 30 days from the due date and it is not yet received by you, that means the credit risk is increased significantly. For 30 days, days past due. 30 days past due. 30 DPD. For this uh, abbreviation they use. For if you have a receivable, you are sold an item on 1st of April and you are given 60 days credit, that means April, May, 1st of June is supposed to pay. But he has not paid it until 30 days past the day, that is 1st of July. Then, 
significant increase in credit risk. You need to calculate lifetime credit risk for that and make a provision. If not, you need to calculate what is a 12 months credit risk and make a provision. This is how the standard defines a significant increase in credit risk. So that is a foundational principle in general approach. Please don't forget we are still in general approach. Yeah. For the main criteria in general approach is significant increase in credit risk. That is defined as 30 days past due. Now, what are the other things the standard tells about general approach? For para 551 says, the entity shall recognize a loss allowance for expected credit loss. Okay, on all the items, on what are the main items? On financial asset that is measured accordance, in accordance with the paragraph 4.1.2. That is talking about 4.1.2 is the financial asset classified as amort at amortized cost. 4.1.2a, financial asset classified at fair value through OCI. Lease receivable under IFRS 16. Contract assets under IFRS 15. Loan commitment under IFRS 9 for banks, mainly general approach for banks. And the financial guarantee contract for banks and non-banks for all these assets. For in a nutshell, there are only three categories of financial assets, as we all know. At amortized cost, at fair value through OCI, at fair value through PNL. For ECL 12, the entity shall recognize the expected credit loss on all financial assets, except those which are categorized under fair value through PNL. Put it in a nutshell. Why fair value through PNL is exempted from ECL? Because the very model takes care of it. Because when you measure an asset at fair value, you are going to adjust the expected credit loss and you are going to take it to PNL. That is why that is exempted. Other two categories are automatically coming into that because of these two paragraphs. Because this is at amortized cost, this is fair value through OCI. Okay, then what it says? Where the credit risk on the financial instrument has increased significantly, you should calculate lifetime expected credit loss where the credit risk on the financial instrument has not increased significantly, you must calculate 12 months credit loss. For so that's how it is there, and then it further goes on to say, what is the definition of increase in credit risk, significant increase in credit risk, 30 days DPD. So far, so good? Great. Okay, for having said that, now this is not in the standard, for so this is outside the paragraph. For this, I put it for you to, for easy understanding of what to do. For any performing asset, any good asset, you will have to calculate 12 months ECL. And this is done when applicable, when there is no significant increase in credit risk. And how do you calculate the interest revenue of, on that? For example, if it is a uh, bank loan given to a client, how it is done? the interest will be calculated on the gross amount. For example, if it is a one million uh, loan and ECL computation for the 12 months credit loss coming to be 100,000, that means the net amount is only 900,000, but the interest will still be computed on the one million. Okay, so that's it. Effective interest on the gross carrying amount. If the same loan, where when you measure the 30 days DPD, it is gone beyond 30 days, in that case, what happens? You have to calculate. It moves from stage one to stage two. So they call that as a migration from stage one to stage two. Yeah? For when that migration happens, how will the migration happens? Because the, the credit risk is significantly increased. What is the criteria? 30 days over, the guy is not picking up the phone. <laughs> For what to do there? you will calculate the lifetime credit loss. For here, 12 months, it will become lifetime. That means instead of 100,000, now your provision may be 200,000. But at the same time, how do you compute the interest income? The interest income will be computed still on the gross amount, okay? But when it goes further down to the third stage, which means the credit loss has occurred, okay? And not even now, picking up the, earlier the phone was ringing, now Omantel is answering, sorry, this number is not, 
available anymore. That means the credit risk is impaired. The asset is impaired, for it is a third stage. In that case, what we are doing, applicable, already impairment happened. For you will continue the same lifetime credit loss, which could be 200,000, but here comes another hit to the P&L. What is it? Your interest income will not be calculated now on the gross amount, unlike the two first two buckets. Now the interest income will be calculated on the net amount. That means 1 million asset, 200,000 is a provision, 800,000 is a value net amount after the provision. You will have to calculate the interest on the 800,000. That's it. That's it in general approach. Nothing more than that. So what is a billion dollar question not answered here? What is a question that is not answered? How to compute the ECL? <laughs> right? So, so much is explained. If you go back here, an entity shall recognize loss elements of expected credit loss. Now, all these 16 paragraphs, they didn't say how to compute it. Is there any model? Is there any method? Is there any technique? Nothing. Is there any formula? Nothing. Silent. So that's general approach. Now let's go further down to simplified approach. And a simplified approach, what the standard says, again here we are having two, two paragraphs, just two paragraphs covering what is simplified approach. What does it say? It says simplified approach is applicable to these three assets. Number one, trade receivables, which is under, generated under IFRS 15, that is your trade receivable from your regular trade debtors, for, from whom you recognize revenue under IFRS 60, 15. Then contract asset, that is if you are having a, like IAS 11, construction contract, you remember the work in progress? For here the same thing, that is here under IFRS 15, it is known as where the in income is recognized over time. How many of you remember IFRS 15? We did it, I think I myself did it in the <laughs> IFRS uh, seminar. For when revenue is recognized over time, you create contract asset, which is nothing but your work in progress, which is nothing but calculated by applying percentage of completion method, yeah? For that asset. Then the third one, re least receivable under IFRS 16. For these three assets, you have to apply simplified approach. The standard doesn't compel you to apply. If you want, if you have the time and the energy and the resources to apply general approach to these assets, go ahead and do it. But if you want to apply simplified approach, then you can apply only to these assets, not to any other assets. For all other assets, you have to apply general approach. That's the point. For now, we have seen this and that, general and simplified. That is why, in practice, in the industry, it is widely accepted. For the banking assets and the financial company assets, NBFCs also, let us apply general approach. For all the non-banking trading entities, airlines, telephone companies, any other industry other than banking, let's apply simplified approach. Now the simplified approach, it's also applicable, though the standard doesn't say, that's why I put that as a separate three heading as also applicable to related party receivables. You all would have done it if it is significant amount. Because most of the time related party receivables are what? Dead assets. Okay, parent company gave it, it never comes back. Okay, so you have to compute ECL. Bank balances, that was a shocker. Nobody thought we will have to, we'll be in a situation where we have to create a provision for bank balances. We are living in a very critical time. <laughs> for bank balances, current balances, and deposit accounts, term deposit, fixed deposit, all of them, where you put money in the bank, you need to compute ECL. Then comes cash balances. Many entities, many countries, even cash balances were subject to ECL. Somehow, there was a lot of uh, discrete discussions took place, 
last year. And that was a time even Modi came out with a rating on different countries and they gave a rating on Oman. Despite all that, there was a consensus developed by Central Bank and CMA and among the audit firms that this year let us not calculate provision for cash balances. That was a good news. But related party and bank balances, last year we did bank balances, bank collapse. Cash too, because government collapses. <laughs> Can you deny that? Government collapses. So what, how to do it? I'll come to that later. Yeah, and how we did it, I'll come to that. So that's how the idea is, we need to do it. By the way, you are, you can ask me any question during the progress of the session as well. And at the end also we'll have a question answer session. I'll try as much as possible to guess what type of questions will be there because I was sitting there for uh, so many seminars and things. For as an audience, I know what questions you will think. I'll try to address as much as possible. Yet if I miss out something, please raise your hand. I'll stop. I'll be more than pleased to explain to you what I know. Thank God cryptocurrency has not yet been considered as a currency yet because globally only two countries have recognized them as currencies. For IFRS is waiting whether to make it. There are two, three areas where IFRS has not put its hand yet. Yeah, for they are taking a little relaxed relax mood. So they came out with the IFRS 17 and even the chairman of IASB, Hans Hugerworth, told, I think we can take some uh, Sabbath take some rest because we, there is no new standard coming up other than IFRS 17, other than some annual improvements coming up. And somebody wrote them telling that, what about cryptocurrencies? Don't talk about it now. Let countries come out with some regulation, then we'll come out with a standard. Yes, sir. Hmm. Yeah, it, it is not entire asset is lost. It become impaired. Okay, it could be partially, it could be fully. That we don't know. But it is impaired. Okay, and what is the definition of impaired or what is the definition of default? I'll come to that later. Yeah, because that is another definition. Okay, for that, the definition for increase, significant increase in credit risk is 30 days DPD. And... The definition of default, again coming to the paragraph, I'll give you the paragraph and define when it comes in the, it's coming up. Yes, sir. Yeah, see, related party, I, I understand what, what you're telling. Yeah, the you there is no due date. Generally, it is given without any condition, you know, like, uh, is this as given basically as a facilitating uh, thing, you know, like uh, maybe there is a liquidity issue and you are stepping in and giving your investee some money. It could be an investee or it could be a related party, a family concern, whatever it is. So the standard is silent on that, how to do it. But... Uh, if there is no movement, now when you say no movement, for how long? Again, the standard is silent. These are all practical explanation. There is nothing mentioned about related party in ECL. But in practical application, since they are classified at fair value through OCA or fair, at fair value through PNL or at amortized cost, if it is even not interest earning, then it, they are subject to IFRS 9. At, that's why it is calculated. For whatever type of uh, transaction it is, it's a running account of buying and selling goods or just a financing, fund giving and fund taking, you know, when the money comes, they will return it. Or something which you invested and you, four years, five years, no movement at all, 
what to do with them. In fact, to cover if it is an associate investment or it is a subsidiary investment, there is an annual improvement coming in which they are telling it is known as the long term. Two approach in the same? Yes, yes, standard is silent. You create your own accounting policy and do it. But. Do it, do it. Standard is silent. Standard is silent. As long as you are able to convince your auditors. Yeah, standard is silent on that. So if you make an accounting policy and consistently follow it, and you have a backup for your policy, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. You mean to say that going to the other approach is going to make life easy? It's far from it. It's the other way around. Simplified approach is much easier than computing. Uh, only one thing is, in the general approach, you have two options, either to go for 12 months credit loss or lifetime credit loss. Under simplified approach, there is no option for all the financial assets. If it is subject to ECL, you will create lifetime credit loss. So, again, you need to be consistent. You need to make a policy accordingly. And you can't just make it today and then change it tomorrow. That's the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then if you see from income tax point of view, it opens another big thing. Because income tax, when you have related party receivable and there is an interest, there are limitations on that. Yeah, our income tax specialist is here, Ramya can help, yeah? So there are limitations on that, okay? So all these are taken into account. Okay, as we know very well, income tax is a different area. For in financial accounting, you will have to create expected credit loss on that. Okay, for so having said that, now we are not yet defined what is default, yeah? For so here comes, because only when the account is defaulted, then it goes into either 12 months or lifetime credit loss. How the standard defines default? As usual, IASB decided not to specifically define default. How convenient it is. But the people who are reading the standard, reading the exposure draft, they didn't leave it. They wrote back so much vehemently telling that you have to define what is default. Then after a lot of thoughting, uh, thinking process, they came out with, again, a rebuttable presumption, where a default is defined as 90 days past due. For if due date is beyond 90 days, the receivable is not at come, it becomes a default. Now, if you think about the RBA norms in India, to classify NPAs, that's a simple rule they follow. 90 days past due, it has to be reclassified as NPAs. Central Bank also does the same thing. Because this was the easiest thing to do for anything non-performing asset. For it will go into the non-performing asset. And you have all the regulatory requirement of uh, how to compute the interest income on that and uh, what provision to be made. All that will be taken care of. For most likely, once it goes there, automatically you will have to calculate the lifetime credit loss and make the provision accordingly. Now, talking so much about lifetime loss and 12 months loss, how to compute it, that is not at addressed. We are coming there. Okay, so that's the definition of default. Please don't mix up between 30 days DPD and 90 days DPD. 30 days DPD is to assess the criteria whether significant increase in the credit risk happens or not. 90 days DPD is for assessing whether the financial asset is defaulted or not. Yeah. Great. Now, we all know, most of the time, even trade receivables, we give 90 days credit. And it doesn't come 90 days, 180 days, 365 days. Some cases, in contracting business, it goes up to one year, two years, three years, still not that come. For that, they all will come under the definition of 
default. So that, from that we are going to compute what is the probability of default. Because having defined everything, now we are entering into what is ECL. Yeah? So you need to understand this periphery before we go into that, how the standard defines ECL. So that is now covered in the last four paragraphs of IFRS 9, 5.5.17, 18, 19, 20. That's it. 20 paragraphs for the whole ECL. Six, 14 for general approach, two for simplified approach, and four how to measure it. Now, did they give any formula here? Nothing. Read it, what it says. An entity shall measure expected credit loss on a financial instrument, and uh, that is determined, sorry, in a financial instrument, in a way that reflects, just I copied paste, I didn't add even a comma full stop there, only I put the boxes for you, for your easy grasping. A, an unbiased probability weighted amount. What in the world it means? Unbiased probability weighted amount. Okay, that is determined by evaluating a range of possible outcome. All oh, looks like out of the world uh, terms. So you have, to have if, if you're not done banking work and the Basel approach, all these terms will mean nothing to you. For a banker, all these terms will make sense because all these are copied from banking Basel regulations. Yeah, unfortunately, non-bankers like you and I will have to apply to our financial assets applying the same thing. For what was earlier under the Basel, we know very well Basel things will not enter into the p &L. It will be only in the notes, in the disclosures. You know that the uh, capital adequacy approach, pillar one, pillar two, how many, any bankers here? Yeah, pillar one, pillar two, and then you will have the uh, stress test, all the, the value at risk, all that VAR, all that computation is done with that. But they all sitting in the notes. It was not required to bring into the books. And now, they are all brought into the books from the notes. That's the main thing. Number two, the time value of money. So that should reflect the time value of money. And number three, this is a relief. They call this as a practical expedient. But I don't know what is expedient here because it makes more complex. Look at it. A reasonable, supportable information that is available. Now they are doing a big favor to all of us. What is it? Without undue cost and effort at the reporting date about the past event, oh, we thought, okay, that means I can take this as a relief that I need not incur undue cost and effort and escape from this. No, that's not possible. Because the next sentence says, Reflecting current conditions and forecast of future economic conditions. For by telling this much complex things, the one simple sentence like reasonable and supportable information without undue cost and effort is nullified. <laughs> Isn't it? Because how can you do? You have to do all this, but you do not incur any cost. How is it possible? For that was a predicament we were all left with. Okay, now having seen that, is there any model given? That was the next question. For we have seen when ECL to be computed, what are the two approaches, and what's the definition of ECL. Now let us see, is there any model given? And para, in the standard it doesn't say anything, but in the uh, application guidance in B 5.5.35, again this is copy paste from the standard. The entity may use a practical expedient. Practical expedient in the sense, practical exemption. What it does, it can do a provision matrix. Provision matrix is nothing but your age analysis where you put 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then for each bucket, you calculate, you apply a percentage based on your past experience and compute it. Wow, that looks very simple and straightforward. And this is what we have been doing under IAS 39. Let us continue doing it. For oh, that was the thing when I first read it, I thought. But when I go deep into that, what it says, look at the fourth line, or third line. The entity would use its historical credit loss experience, okay, that's my age analysis. They could have kept quiet. 
They didn't do that. They added this paragraph. What is it? Adjusted as appropriate. The entity would use its historical credit loss experience, adjusted as appropriate in accordance with paragraph 5.5.51. We are in para 5.5.35, and they are referring to 5.5.51 and 5.5.52. So that two lines completely nullify the practical expedient. Now you are compelled to go and look at what is that 5.5.51 and 52. That means, can I go for this provision matrix, the simple old model, I use it? No. Provided you do with, comply with 5.5.51 and 5.5.52. For now, let's go there and see what these two paragraphs are talking. Otherwise, it's a very simple model. You know, like when you go down to the paragraph, what it says, provision matrix, my example, specify the fixed provision, uh, provision rates depending on the number of days that a trade receivable is passed to you. For example, 1% if not passed to you, 2% if less than 30 days. 3% uh, if more than 30 days but less than 90 days, 20% if more than 90 days. Well, this sounds very much like our old IAS 39 provision or IAS 37 provision we make for doubtful debts or allowance for uh, credit loss, as the new term called. It's the same thing, but the problem is you can't apply it. Why? Because you have to apply 51 and 52 paragraphs. What in the world these two paragraphs are telling? Let's go to 5551. An entity need not undertake an exhaustive search for information. Oh, that looks nice. But, I hate that word, but. Who likes but? But shall consider all reasonable and supportable information that is available without undue cost and effort. Looks interesting. And that is relevant to the estimate of the expected credit loss, including the effect of the expected prepayment. So far, so good. Okay. Next, the information used shall include factors that are specific to the borrower. They started the complex, you know, complicating the things. It's typical of IAS. They shall include factors that are specific to the borrower. Okay. General economic condition. Yeah, this age analysis was making my life easy. I just calculated the percentages. I made a provision matrix. Now, you can't do it. You have to apply all these things. For general economic condition, an assessment of both the current as well as the forecast direction of the condition, that means the GDP growth, the currency fluctuation, the oil rate, the unemployment, everything I need to take into account. At the reporting date. Okay? For where do I get all that? Come to the next paragraph. So I'm just giving only Part of it, the very important part, what it says. What it happens, you need to, while doing the provision matrix, you need to take into account unemployment rate, property prices, commodity prices, payment status, and other factors that are indicative of the credit losses on the financial instrument of the group. Ultimately, we thought that they are giving a practical expedient and relief. Now, by reading this, we understand it's all the more complicated. For having said this much and confused us, Okay? Now, I'm not giving any model, not any technique, not any method. What is left out? Okay? This is where we have to thank Basel Regulation. Okay? For when you go to the basis for conclusion, not in the standards, you know, the part A and part B, part C, you have to go to the part C of the book. There, when you look at B, C, E of IFRS 9, 125, it says, some users' financial statement ask the IASB to ensure that the impairment model is both aligned to the prudential capital framework. These are the terms taken from Basel. And it's countercyclical. That means not the coinciding with the trade cycle, but opposite to the trade cycle, resulting in a loss element that is sufficient to absorb all credit losses. And para BCE 128, further it says, for actually what happened is, some of the people who read the exposure draft, they wrote back to the standard setters telling that you defined ECL in such a way nobody can understand. Then you told that you will give a practical expedient. 
Then you complicated that further by adding two paragraphs telling that you need to look at all the macroeconomic factors. And at the end, you came out with no technique, no method, no formula. What in the world we can do with this type of standard? Give us some relief. So that is where this paragraph helped. What it says, IASB discussed the new impairment model and shared the information with the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. That's why it's called BCBS, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, through its accounting experts group and throughout the course of the project in order to enable the interaction between, interaction of the new impairment model with the relevant regulatory requirement. For at the end, they came back telling that, now let us look at Basel model and whatever Basel model is doing to compute the expected credit loss and which was just projected and disclosed in the notes, not accounted. Now you need to bring it into the account, apply that model and calculate your ECL. That is it. Now let's go to the last issue. Uh, what Basel talks about expected credit loss. Now, since IFRS 9 does not provide any more financial model or formula to compute the ECL, we take the model from Basel regulation, which states the ECL, expected credit loss, is equal to EAD, exposure at, def at uh, default, which is nothing but your trade receivable at the end of the year. Multiplied by PD, standing for the probability of default. Multiplied by LGD, which is the loss given default. For ECL, is nothing but a product of these three elements. Okay, for your total account receivable, I'll put it in a simple way. For if a receivable is one million, your probability of default you computed, how to compute it? Again, we'll see that. It's coming to be, say, 0.2%. 0 0.2% of 1 million is how much? 2,000? Uh, 2%, let us say. 2%, which is 2,000. And the LGD is coming to be 80%. That means 1 million into 2% into 80%, or 0 0.8. So the answer is 1,600. Your ECL has to be 1,600. That's a simple thing. For now, we know what is EAD. EAD is nothing but your receivable total, your bank balance total, your related party receivable total. And PD is, we have not seen yet, for we need to compute PD first. Then we have to know what is LGD and compute. Now how to compute the PD for trade receivable? So we all know trade receivable is generally put in a aging bucket. We all know the age-old age analysis, right? <laughs> For age analysis, I just look at only this part. This is nothing but the age analysis of a particular. It's a real fact or a real data from one existing company, one of our clients. Yep. And as you see, we are having not the monthly bucket or monthly movement of the receivable because we are computing as of March 31st, how much is the expected credit loss for we have to compute EAD we know. What is the EAD amount? 681319. That is the exposure at default. The total receivable balance. That is put in five buckets as 0 to 90, 91 to 80, 181 to 270, 270 to 360, and above 360. So that's how this figure is there. Now I need to compute the PD. For I go back to the definition of ECL, what the standard says your historical data to be used. For I have to go at least, this PD in the basal is known as TTC PD. TTC standing for through the cycle. That means through at least one business cycle you need to take. Because historically, you know, according to Keynesian economics, a business cycle is of seven to eight years. We all know that, you know. The business cycle goes Growth, and then peak, and then recession and depression comes to the bottom, and again growth, it goes. For from one top to the next top, it is expected to be eight years, but now the latest one, nobody knows. Now the whole economy is gone haywire. Okay. For, is it an eight-year trade cycle? We don't know. 
for the standard says you must compute the probability of default through the cycle, at least one full cycle if you take, you will be in a position to know whatever happens in the economy, what will be the status of your probability of default. That's the point. That's why it is known as TTCPD. For we are, our endeavor here is to compute the TTCPD. But as you all know, TTCPD is a historic PD. And our aim is to compute expected credit loss. That means we have to compute first the TTCPD through the cycle PD from the past history. And then we need to project into future by adding forward looking factors and compute the expected PD and apply the formula EAD into PD into LGD. Is it clear? So that's a process. Now how to compute the PD? For first, let us see how to compute the TTC PD, through the cycle PD. For we take at least eight year data. When I go to my client and then ask for eight year data, <laughs> okay, so they will see, is there any way of changing the auditors? <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> okay, for eight year data, nobody gives. At least five year data. For big borrow steel, that's what we do. For big borrow steel with the client and get at least five year data. Some people say five year data we don't have, sir. Three year data, uh, we can give one year data. <laughs> no, <laughs> let us bargain. For we come as much as, because you need to have the larger the data, the better the statistics. You know, the theory of large numbers. So if you have only one year data, your history is not going to be right. Either it will be completely skewed. For we want that to reflect the TTCPD. Please understand my clients, many of you may be my clients. For when we ask for one eight year data, is a reason for that. Because we have to know how the company performed through the one full business cycle. That's the logic behind it. For many of the times we understand this term, at least we hear this term, but we don't understand what is the logic of that? This is the logic. For we take eight year data. For this client was ready to give from March 2015. I thanked him especially for that. And then he told, I can't give monthly bucket, I can give only quarterly bucket. For the quarterly March, then June, September, it goes like that. But when I have quarterly bucket, here my uh, verticals, buckets should be of same corresponding 90 days. If I have monthly data here, then it could be 30, 60, 90 days. The correspondence has to be there because I'm going to compute the probability using this table. The probability of default, PD. Okay, for, and then that data has to be hygienic. For example, in, the logic is when something is like in March 2015, zero to 90 days was 280, 281. 287, out of which, when it goes to June, the same is sitting here, right? This 118 came from here, understand? Agreed, logic. And then that become, further I collected, it became 45. Then it become 35. But here it becomes 80. How it's possible? Are you with me what I'm talking? Because, the receivable, I can collect, it can't increase, it has to keep decreasing as we go forward. But here, what happened exactly? Well, when we investigated, we found these guys posted one invoice after eight months, putting a back date. For these are the problems in the data. For the data has to be hygienic if you want to compute the TTCPD in a logical, proper way. It cannot have minus figures. The advance received will be sitting in one bucket. In all other buckets, it will be debit balance. In this bucket, it will be a credit balance. We need to offset it. We need to make it zero. For these are the basic problems in the PD computation when you go from the age analysis. For after doing all the data cleaning, data hygienic, then we come to a proper data, then we compute it. For how we do it, the first step, that's why there are three steps to be used for computing the PD. First step is, Computing the probability, that's very simple. Bucket to bucket, what is the probability? This divided by this, 42%. This divided by this, 
see, therefore, the color coding is given accordingly. For I compute this, or we compute this, and put. Now, in this case, anything more than 270 is completely default. Because what is the definition of default according to ECL, according to the standard? 90 days. Now, in this case, another big problem will be the age analysis. The age analysis which every accounting package, including tally, gives you, but many a times it is not accurate. A true age analysis should have the total balance, not due column. Because when you give a credit facility, until the credit days is over, you can't call the client. It has to be a separate bucket called not due. Then it has to start with 0 to 90 like that. And to prepare the age analysis in the most accurate way, the age analysis should be prepared not from the invoice date, but from the due date. Right? But most of the age analysis are prepared based on the invoice date, not the due date. Why, why it is difficult for the system to do? Because if you want to prepare the, from the due date, then for each customer, you have to have a customer master. In the customer master, you should give a credit days. Some people 60 days, some people no credit, some people 90 days. Then the system, if you are making an invoice on 1st of April, it has to go and see for this customer what is the credit period, 60 days. That means until June end, it should be sitting in which bucket? Not due. The due date has to be calculated only after passing 1st of July. 99% of the age analysis today don't have that facility, including Oracle Financials and SAP, unless you specifically configure at the time of implementing the ERP. I told you, if you, complete, if you configure it, it is there. SAP gives both. You can make the age analysis from the invoice date and from the due date. Even tally does, but you should configure it. How many of us really put, as finance manager, finance controller, looked at the age analysis from the system? Only for audit purpose, we take it and give, right? For that's a problem. For we need to look at all that. For these are all the problems in the PD computation. For once we set right all of them, then we compute these percentages. That's step one. Now, the probabilities are computed. But these probabilities, again, we use the two basic statistical tools like time series and the probability analysis. For time series is what? You can't take one period, you have to smoothen the data further by computing averages so that the data, your final product will be representative of the population. For we need to do step number two. In step number two, what we do? For, again, go back to the step one. For this method, what we are computing the probability of default method is known as flow rate mechanism. That is, at what rate the amount is moving, flowing from one bucket to the other bucket. That's a probability we compute. For again, this flow rate is not defined in the standard. It is a term which is used in the audit circle and the accounting circle. For it's called flow rate mechanism, or it's called roll rate mechanism, or it's called migration mechanism. Sometimes the word migration is also used in the general approach from 30 days, the stage one, stage two, stage three movement is also known as migration approach. Yeah, therefore these are the loose terms which is not defined anywhere, but it is there in practically it helps us. For this technique, what we use for computing probability is known as flow rate mechanism. And then this is step one. And step two, further we have this, for we are going to compute the Joint probability, as you know very well, in probability theory, joint probability is nothing but multiplication of the two probabilities. For when we do the joint probability, we take how much is a joint probability of 0 to 90 bucket? We take this into this because these are the corresponding probability. Uh, coming back to this, uh, why this 27, 271 to 360 is 100%? Because in this client, they used to give, they told that anything more than 180%, 180 days is difficult to get. For that is taken as 180, plus the standard gives you a default cushion of 90 days. For both put together, 270 days. But if you go 90 plus 90, then you have to start anything more than 180 days will become 100%. Got it? For these are the logics we have to use. 
that is why the credit policy the credit uh, period is so important most of the time finance managers don't even look into this application sales guys give their own credit terms and only when the collection date comes we come into the picture but as finance controllers you need to take up the proactive role now onwards that when you give a credit these are the things you need to take care okay so when we come to the last stage step number 2 so we compute the total point like this for all these bucket we compute the for the 17 quarters we have why 17 because first quarter is zero why first quarter is zero because here we know that this the first line we can't put the rate so we need the past data so here we have the final product probability and this is for the three four years with the 12 for 17 quarters for so we need to come out with one figure to compute the pd in the ecl so what we do, we give a weightage to the period. Older the data, lesser weight. Later the data, higher the weight. For we give weightage 1 to 17. And we compute the weighted average of this and this. This and this. This and this. This and this and this. Okay? For when we put it, the weighted average, because of these weightages, it becomes 88, otherwise everything is 100. Because of the weight multiplication, it comes 88.7. For this is the historic, through the cycle PD, we computed. Yeah. For these are the first step and second step. The third step is the most daunting. Yes, sir? What is the logic for the weight the same? Weight's the same. Weight is not the same. I told you, no? So what is the logic? The older the data, lesser the weight. Older the data, lesser the weight. For first quarter, I put 1. The latest quarter, I put 17. And how did 17 The multiplication of 1, these green items. So on all these things, we take and put the figures. Okay? For this flow rate mechanism. And uh, for we created this but what the standard says the standard says if you remember go back to the definition of ecl unbiased probability weighted amount we have done it range of possible outcome that we need to take and the c point what is it forward looking or future economic condition, that is going to be the third, third stage, which is the most complicated stage. For we have to go for the expected. So far we got the through the cycle PD. From that we are going to calculate expected PD. For coming back to this stage, how to go for the forward-looking PD. That's the last step in the PD. For ECL requires calculation to be forward-looking. However, what PD we computed is the TTC, through the cycle historic PD. How are PDs computed aging, basically historic data? For the TTC PD is converted into forward-looking PD by incorporating forward-looking macroeconomic variables. How do I know why this situation in the PD? Basically, it depends on which industry you are. You could be affected by the oil prices. You could be affected by the GDP growth rate. You could be affected by any other macroeconomic factor like currencies or whatever you think of. One of the very common uh, a macroeconomic factors that affects in this part of the world, we all know, is the oil price. For you need to find out which macroeconomic factor is affecting my company and you should develop a correlation between, you should compute a correlation between your PD and the respective economic factor and see which economic factor is very highly correlated with your PD. Easier said than done. And you should choose that economic factor and then see what is the projection of that economic factor in the next five years. For if that economic factor, for example, oil price, is going up like this, what will happen to my PD projected? For simple correlation exercise. How many of you remember correlation <laughs> coefficient? Yeah, As you all know, correlation coefficient should be as low as minus 1, as high as plus 1. Okay, so you need to compute that. Now, that's the most complex thing. How to do it? 
for generally it is a conversion required application of advanced statistical model. And the most popular models widely used to, for this is called Vasicek framework or multivariate regression based framework. So you need to compute the regression analysis of the PDs, percentages, with any of the macroeconomic factors. But the good, uh, the, one of the um, big reliefs is the last sentence. What is it? However, IFRS 9 gracefully provides a practical expedient. What is a practical expedient? Without incurring undue cost and effort. So we cling on to that. And if auditor asks or somebody asks, without incurring undue cost and effort. So I can't do this without incurring. This involves a lot of effort. I have to go back and open my statistics book and see what is correlation coefficient. So taking that as a cue, we have to do. Okay, that's on the lighter side. But practically what we have done, in this particular company, we did an analysis. It's an interesting study. So here we have the PDs. Okay, the green line is 180, 12, 270. For so these are the different PD buckets. And the global oil price movement from 2013 to 2018. And if you see here, when the oil price was high, the PDs were low. And the, as the oil price came down, the PDs are going up. Okay. So luckily it happened like this. If this correlation is not coming through, then I won't have a justification. For now, I tested with the oil price, then now I have to go and test with GDP rate. Or I have to go and uh, test my correlation with unemployment rate. And most of the time, none of these factors matter. What really matters in Muscat is what, or in Oman is what? When government is going to release the payment. <laughs> now, that is not considered as a macroeconomic factor anywhere in the world. But in this part of the world, that is a crux. When government releases the payment, when the PDO, when the ROP releases the payment, the main contractor will get, he will pay to the subcontractor, it will come flow into the market. We all know the practical issue, right? Within the room, eh? not outside. Okay. So that is the issue here. But that we don't have the statistic to compute it. For so we go by the macroeconomic well-known statistic, and then we assume that's the thing. And then we go, if you really want to know how the VASI check looks, this is how it looks. Yeah, don't get a nightmare, no need to do that. Yeah, so although VASI check model appears simple and straightforward, it requires, is it looking simple and straightforward? Not to me. It requires a high level statistical knowledge to analyze a large quantity of data, is therefore not considered to be worth cost effort for simple trade receivable portfolio. That's a paragraph we created and put it in our report. Yeah, so we came out with that. We created our own scenario analysis. Because what the standard says, possible outcomes, let us create our own possible outcome. One of the, pre one of the various possible outcomes, for so this is the last step in PD. Don't forget, we are just still doing PD. We know what is EAD, now we are finishing with PD, then we have to go for LGD, and you will stay till 10 o'clock in the night, okay? I'm just kidding. Okay, for PD estimation, historic to forward looking step three, for this is what we computed from the earlier table, the through the cycle PD, for how we created the scenario analysis, for we create, the base case is this. But the best case is oil price going up, as a result, the TDC, TTC PD reduced by 10%. So what happened when we were Doing this is really God-given grace at the time. When we're doing this exercise, scratching our head what to do, which macroeconomic factor we can just, because this is we made for a client who is audited by one of the other auditors. So they will, I know very well they will come and ask all these questions. What are their auditors for, other than asking questions, right? <laughs> for I being an auditor, I can say that. So they will come and ask all these questions. I have to justify what I have done. That's a problem. So what we have done, at that very moment, that week, Oman government released their budget. And there they projected increase in the oil price. And they projected their GDP, if the oil price increases, how it will be, if the dip decreases, what will, how it will be. And there they used, there is a 60% chance of oil price going up 
as a result PD coming down. And there is a 30% chance of oil price going down as a result PD is going up. They didn't talk about PD. They told only about the two scenarios. We picked up a cue from there and we put it in our calculation. And for best cases, 10% reduction. As a result, this is reduced by 10%. The worst case is 20% increase, and that is increased by 20%. Now we computed the forward-looking PD with the three different scenarios. What is the weighted average of these with these three weights? Are you justified? Or am I justified? In your eyes? Yeah? For looking at the ECL definition, could we have done anything better than this without incurring, incurring undue cost and effort? <laughs> Don't forget that phrase. Yeah. For the auditors accepted it. It took effort. It took effort, exactly. Uh, sorry? Yeah, for us it's a revenue. For the client it's maybe the cost. <laughs> okay, great. For now PD is computed, yeah? Now comes the next factor, the last factor, which is last given default, LGD. LGD is nothing but, if the PD occurs, what will be the loss to be incurred by the entity, especially for the particular account receivable, the particular EAD. And we all know that the account receivables are generally unsecured, but in special cases, that can be secured. Secured by a what? By a LC or a bank guarantee. For, for example, if you take a receivable of 1 million, for which the client has given a LC or a bank guarantee of 800,000, that means if the default happens, how much money you can get? 800 I can claim from the bank, and the 200 will be the loss. For what is my recovery rate? Recovery rate is 80%. As a result, my LGD is 20%, 1 minus RR. Is it clear? For recovery rate, I need to know. Recovery rate is nothing but the value of the collateral. In the case of LCs and LGs, it's easy to find the collateral because there is no haircut. Haircut. Yes, you, hear pro you heard properly. It is haircut. What is haircut? Haircut is a reduction in the value of the collateral. Yeah. For in this case, bank guarantee doesn't reduce in any way. Of course, there is a bank risk. That's different. For we take, in this case, 100% recovery. Therefore, LGD is, RR is 80%, LGD is 20%. For that is what we do. Now, wherever bank guarantees is there, we can take it that way. Wherever LCs are there, we can take it. Wherever there is an export debtor, and the export credit guarantee is there, and export credit guarantee also gives you 80% recovery. You can claim up to 80%. For that also you can take as a recovery. As a result, LGD will be 20%. For it is very easy for secured debtors to compute the LGD. But what to do with the unsecured debtors, which is my trade receivable, is nothing but unsecured. In which case, yes, sir? Nope. Nope. Because in the court of law, it doesn't stand. For PDC, in many cases are there where the court very categorically told, check is a negotiable instrument. The purpose of that is a mode of payment. You can't use a check as a mode of security. It is illegal to use PDC as a security. For it doesn't stand in the court of law. Okay, for we don't take. Most of our clients were happy to show us PDCs. PDCs are nothing but a piece of paper. They don't count for ECL computation. OK, for we take that collateral. Now the main problem arises, what to do with the unsecured? For truly speaking, unsecured, the LGD, how much? 100%. That sounds to be too much for many of the creditors, especially for contracting companies, where they are having outstanding receivable from ministries, municipality, ROP, PDOP, PDO, they told it's crazy, please don't make us uh, make this much of provision. You can't make 100% LGD for what to do. Again, who came to help? Basel requirement. <laughs> for in Basel, what they say LGD is, 
Wherever there is a subordinated climb on corporate, the LGD can be computed as 75%. This is again Basel II publication, para number 288. I talk only with reference. I don't give my own idea. Okay. So you can note that and quote that for para 288. So that is for the subordinated. But uh, my trade receivable are primary climb. They are not subordinated. For in that case, what I can do? LGD will be 45%. For the senior climbs, 45%. For so that came as a big relief. For so we went up to apply 45%. Therefore, ECL is equal to EAD into PD into LGD. I computed the EAD is simple. PD I computed. Forward looking I did. Everything done. PD is ready. Now LGD is also ready. So I went to prepare the ECL computation table. So this is how it is done. What the standard says on day one, day one means we all did it as a 1-1-2019. One, one, on day one, whatever ECL comes, that will be offset against the retained earnings because that belongs to the past. For if, in this case, how we did it? For the EAD is 681, you remember the table and the buckets and the PD and the LGD because they are all unsecured and multiply all the three and compute the total. It is 135. And this company already had 100,000 provision. That means the excess 35, I need to go and adjust against retained earnings. Debit retained earnings, credit provision as of 1 1 2000. Now, 18, we did it. Oh, sorry, 19, we did it. No, wait a minute. <laughs> Last year, 18, we did it. Then do the same exercise at the end of the year, and whatever excess or shortage is there, you have to take from the PNL. And now, as we go forward to 31st December 2018, 19, we will do the same exercise and do that and go ahead with that. That's how the ECL enigma was resolved. Yes, sir. Uh, before that, E raises hand. Yeah? Yes. If you are a regulated entity, CMA and CBO expects you to do that. And uh, one good thing is, in this part of the world, quarterly accounts are not audited. It is only reviewed by the internal audit. Therefore, uh, many entities did, did and didn't do it. I don't want to talk about it. Leave it. Yes, sir. Your question? Yeah. I mean, there is no other way to define default. Unless the bank, uh, bankruptcy of the uh, data for... Yes, if you remember the definition, para B says time value of money. But in the case of trade receivable, since they are less than 12 months, in IFRS, wherever time value of money is there, you apply it only when it is more than 12 months. When it is less than 12 months, we ignore the time value of money. As a result, in trade receivable, since it is expected to be less than 12 months, we ignore the time value of the money. But when it comes to bank deposits and related party receivable, we apply the time value of the money. That time value risk also, time risk also is taken into consideration, in addition to the credit risk. Uh, which one? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the very definition of default is 90 days past due. Yes, sir. That we have done. Now we only need to yeah. do the current year. Yeah, the current year to that. Correct. And remove the oldest year. Yeah, that's better, no? Because so that uh, the older data doesn't uh, uh, what to keep, uh, disrupt, disrupt the flow. Okay. Yeah. One year later, you know, to data. Mm. Yeah. And Through the cycle, yeah. at least five years. Yeah. I know. They do what is the actual write-off. Yes. Okay. That is the another, uh, you can say, corollary. But the point is, nobody writes off their bad debts. Because that requires a very difficult thing, because you need to go up to the board level. 
the best thing make a provision try your level best even though you know very well this is gone the guy has run away from the country it is not going to come come at all you still don't want to uh make a write off note to your board because you know very well you learned to from ias 39 if you don't like the message shoot the messenger that is a practice in the world for don't give a bad message message that's a point for you take the presumption that you have made a provision and their provision continues for so many years yeah yeah consider it as you said it's not wrong consider it as a right and calculate it absolutely sanal the standard is silent on all these things you can do that's why i told there is no one single method you do whatever you want to do as long as you are able to convince the other party your auditor or whoever it is i told you what is there in the standard for what is not in the standard what is the use of talking about it now if we are 60 people all 60 will have 60 different models that's why i told you in the beginning there is no uniformity yes sir yeah yeah the main reason is i have taken the 45% lgd had i taken 100% lgd the full 180 will be provided again the standard is silent i told you what is there in the standard there is nothing else in the standard if you want to argue with me that you are going to do that i will keep quiet i'll say please do it be my guest the standard is silent no that is my opinion if you want then I, you have to pay me a fee <laughs> that becomes a consultant fee <laughs> because when i say something i need to justify it okay is on the lighter side I, i would be happy to go ahead with what is there now this itself is going to kill the client already business is down already there is a huge outstanding and i am asking him to make 135000 provision it's not a small money on an outstanding of 700000 huge that's why i told you even the good ones you need to provide that is the meaning of expected credit class for you can argue oh when you, that is 181 why this is so less you must make 181 you are right see that's why i told you in that case what will happen you have to go for the lgd of 100% no what is the actual right off now are you talking as a finance manager or talking as an auditor so easy to say as a neutral person anything but you have to take a stand and argue for that sorry sir agreed very simple very simple no auditors have taken a lean to tell you sir tell you the fact auditors have taken a lenient view indirectly discreetly even government gave cbo and the cma indirectly gave not to be too harsh on ecl with the clients because they know very well this is genuine now the client is arguing with me that 181000 is due from rpo rop or pdo you mean to say i need to make a provision that is why i have taken to favor the client as lgd of 45 you go and take lgd of 100 and provide i told you i am not justifying what i have done i am telling this i have done because of the backup i have but if you say that forget the backup when you look at the 181 you must have made a ecl of 181 be my guest please do it if you are the finance manager would you do that as an auditor i would rather very happy to make 181 as a provision provided i am ready to lose my client next year <laughs> 
Then in that case, in that bucket, I will put the LGD as 100%, matter over. Yeah, now that's a different thing. That's a different thing. Then in that case, what happens? What I am telling that there was an existing provision of 100,000, that's why I provided 35. The general, pro that 100 was a general provision. If there is only a general provision, you can take that approach. But if there are some legal cases, there are specific cases where you made a provision for them, then that will be minus the first. For example, anything more than 271 to 360 out of the 26,000, you see that? And there is a legal case in which I need to get 10,000, then I will reduce that 10,000 and make a 100% provision for that. Yes, here, in, the, in this, the top line I will remove. One, once I put exposure at default, I will make specific provision for legal cases. And I will go to this bucket and minus 10,000 10, and make only 16,000 and apply these two. The standard is silent. The standard is silent. Now the point is, since the provision is already made, I would rather do it in the, before computing the probability. That would have been a better approach. Again, there is no logic, there is no standard for that. You apply a logic and then do it. Uh, now, argue, you argue with her, why are you arguing with me? <laughs> you got the point where we are? That's the reality. You can argue anything. I'm just here to tell you what the standard says and what is the best thing to do. I won't say this is 100% right. I will never say that. This is one way of doing and most accepted way of doing. Yeah? <laughs> Great, I think I'm done. For the last thing, ECL for other assets, the best thing to do, read related party, we don't have age analysis, we don't have anything. For the best thing is go to Modi's rating and see where is your related party, in which industry is there. Industry-wise ratings are available, just to prepare it and do it. Bank balances, again Modi has given for each bank in Oman, we have a rating. Use that and apply it. In these cases, only PD is applied. There is no LGD. LGD is taken as zero. Uh, not zero. If you take zero, then ECL will become zero. LGD is taken as one, 100 percent. Yeah. For just apply the PD and take it. And cash balances in Oman, we didn't do it last year, but the way Moody and the other agencies are downgrading Oman and these countries around us, going ahead next two three years, we may have to compute ECL for cash also. Yeah. So, no, when last year, what, what is the definition of uh, default, or what is the definition of significant increase in the credit risk? 30 days past due. In the case of a country, how we can do it? Downgrading by the external agencies. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. What you are talking is only for the hyperinflationary system. That's a different thing. IAS 29 uh, talks about it. Here we are talking about the cash balance. For if we have Omani Rial, then the rate will be different. If we have US dollar, then the rate will be different. Provided we go for it, as I told last year, nobody did it. For let us not talk about too much about it. Otherwise, this year, and somebody will say, you have to make it, and we all have to make it. Sir, what is happening with uh, uh, Punjab Maharashtra Bank in India? Why Modi is giving bank-wise rate, rating? Why Modi is not giving all banks same rating? It's a point of argument. Exactly, exactly. No, no, we are mixing up. He is asking bank balance. Uh, he has gone. You want to Cash will be only the country risk. No, that's what I'm saying. By the way, I am not arguing. I am not telling you you must make an ECL for cash balance. I am just telling what is there in the standard. Okay, I didn't make the standards. Please, don't throw stone at me. Yeah, but is that a cost of a risk of 
Uh, it's not devaluation, it could be, again, country-wise Modi rating. You know, there are so many factors. Why a few, few years back, uh, Greece was having a problem? Why a few years back, Greece was a problem, Portugal was a problem, Italy, you know, they say PIGS countries. Okay, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and uh, yes, for what? Uh, Spain, yeah. So there was a risk at that point of time. Now the countries have come out. Now when Brexit happens, what will happen to currency? Everybody is expecting euro will become weaker and the pound sterling will become stronger. For again, there are contrary theories. For these are the risks. If you are holding your currency in pound sterling and you know very well there is going to be a 10% deterioration, then the expected credit loss according to IFRS 9 expects you to make that provision. I hope, please don't tell me about all macroeconomic theories. We know, whatever it is, currency rate, interest rate risk, purchasing power parity, whatever it is, there is a risk, there is a rating, you compute the ECL, period. Yep. Well, that's a different ball game. We are not talking here to talk about it. Maybe at the end of it, we'll talk. My endeavor is to talk about ECL. And I don't know whether I am successful in making you more confused than when you came, <laughs> or less confused. This is a body of knowledge which is subject to so much of judgment and estimates. And I hope I've done justice to that. And uh, once again, the final recap, this is a thing you should remember. ECL is equal to, especially for the simplified approach for the non-banking sector, for the trade receivable, for EAD, outstanding balance, aging bucket, PD, that flow rate probability, and other assets, Moody rating, and the LGD, secured actual LGD, unsecured basal rating. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I guess the session was getting hot and hot. I can feel the heat coming. You know, it was a good argument in the end. We probably need one more session, I believe, for unexpected credit loss. <laughs> so this is the session. Is we, the standard, yeah, this is the me. session. We'll try to bring you again. So thank you very much. Uh, may, may, I, may I request you all, you know, to please applaud him. You know, it's a great session we have. Thank you very, thank you very much. And I guess the uh, the, the final uh, thing left for the day is the vote of thanks, a formal vote of thanks. And please stay. We need to take one photograph with all of you as well. So please, Sunil Bhai. Yeah. 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 Please here. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ravi. Uh, he has always been there for to support us. Whenever we called him, he is always there to talk about various standards during IFRS seminars as well as today. This is uh, actually enriched us how to calculate ECL and uh, there has been certain what you call uh, doubts in our mind which has been set to rest. And thank you very much for everyone to be present today here as well as uh, for CBFS for giving the whole to us. Uh, as uh, as always been, they have been our support throughout the, the events. Thank you very much.